Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Robert Golden, Dean of the School of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Wisconsin. Welcome to our final presentation for the 2021 Wisconsin Medicine live stream series. Tonight's program focuses on how we are tackling the growing problem of antibiotic and antifungal resistance. You know, antibiotics revolutionized medical treatments in the 20th century, saving countless lives by turning what used to be life-threatening infections into highly treatable conditions. But microbes can adapt to drugs and develop resistance. Each year in the United States, at least 2.8 million people become ill with an antibiotic resistant infection, and more than 35,000 of them will perish as a result. Antibiotic resistance threatens advances in organ transplants, cancer therapy, and the treatment of many chronic diseases. Tonight, we are blessed to have three renowned scientists who will talk about the scope of drug-resistant infections and what the future holds for discovering new antibiotics. They will share the very exciting breakthroughs here at the University of Wisconsin as we develop innovative, novel approaches to defeating bacterial and fungal infections. First up tonight, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Andes. Dr. Andes, the William A. Craig Endowed Professor, is chief of our Division of Infectious Diseases within our Department of Medicine, and also holds an appointment in our Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology. He directs the Wisconsin Antimicrobial Drug Discovery and Development, NIH Center of Excellence. Welcome, Dave. Thanks, Dean Golden. Next slide. I'll begin this evening uh, with a bit of history uh, on antibiotics and then bring us to the current uh, state uh, with antimicrobial resistance and then discuss a bit about uh, our team's effort to discover uh, new antibiotics. Next slide. I think we often take for granted the importance of antibiotics. They're illustrated by this case, which is the first published case of the use of penicillin in a young girl who presented with what started out as a simple skin infection, uh, presenting to the hospital quite ill. Next slide. You can see she was quite ill and after a very brief course of penicillin, recovered uh, dramatically uh, and lived a long life thereafter. Next slide. As Dean Golden mentioned, uh, antibiotics are perhaps the most effective uh, pharmaceutical class uh, ever discovered, uh, improving mortality uh, due to common infections, uh, many, many, many fold. Next slide. But these pharmaceutical agents are unique in another way in that they predictably lose effectiveness over time due to the emergence of antibiotic resistance, as illustrated by this cartoon, where on the top you have the clinical, the date of clinical introduction of a subset of antibiotics, and on the bottom you have the date uh, after in initiation of antibiotic use that resistance was discovered. Uh, what you see here is that the useful lifespan of antibiotics is actually relatively short and far less than a decade. And in fact, the last antibiotic with a new mode of action is on the far right, uh, daptomycin. Uh, resistance has already emerged, uh, leaving patients without uh, effective therapies. Next slide. And this problem of antibiotic resistance has increased in importance uh, quantitatively over the last two decades, uh, such that it really uh, leaves no one untouched. In fact, clinicians at our hospital, on average, encounter a patient with an infection every day for which there is not an effective therapy. In the United States, the Center for Disease Control in 2019 uh, estimated that on an annual basis, almost 1% of our population is infected 
with an antimicrobial resistant infection, leading to death in a substantial proportion of these patients. There are modeling estimates that suggest that worldwide, if we continue upon the current path, that by 2015, more than 10 million individuals will succumb to antibiotic resistant infections on an annual basis. Next slide. If you crunch the numbers in the United States alone, every 11 seconds, a patient is infected with an antimicrobial resistant pathogen and four times every hour, someone dies from one of these infections. Next slide. This is unfortunately happening at the same time that antibiotic discovery has stalled. As I mentioned, the last new antibiotic class uh, was discovered uh, more than three decades ago. Next slide. You might not recognize this gentleman, but I suspect you'll be familiar with his discovery of penicillin in the late 1920s. Next slide. Penicillin is what's termed a natural product antibiotic, as are the great majority of the antibiotics um, that we use in our patients. And these are products or chemicals that are produced by either a plant, an animal, or in most instances, a microbe. And they're different from chemicals that we make ourselves in the lab and that they have an evolutionary history. Next slide. And natural product antibiotic discovery was quite fruitful uh, from the 1940s for several decades uh, into the late 1970s, uh, where many new discoveries were happening on an annual basis. But you can see the rate of discovery tailed off quite a bit. And the last new antibiotic uh, drug class that was uh, uh, discovered was in 1987. Next slide. There are both scientific and financial reasons for this tail off uh, of new antibiotic discovery. Uh, one is uh, the fact that uh, most discovery was, a uh, natural product discovery was based upon identification of antibiotics from bacteria that were isolated from the soil. Uh, and scientists were finding that they were fi discovering the same antibiotics over and over again, a rediscovery rate that was very high. And in fact, uh, they had to screen a million Bacterial, uh, bacterial isolates from the soil to discover that last new antibiotic, daptomycin. Next slide. This fact led the pharmaceutical industry to abandon natural product discovery. We challenge uh, this sentiment. Next slide. So our story begins with these guys. These are leaf cutter ants. Next slide. So they cut the leaves, they don't eat the leaves. These ants are farmers uh, and they feed the leaves to their crop, which is shown in the top right. Unfortunately for the ants, there are infection pathogens in the environment that left unchecked will destroy that crop and the ant colony will die. A seminal discovery uh, by one of our, my collaborators, uh, Professor Curry, uh, was the study of that white material you can see on what's called the pre-pleural plate of these ants. And there's a high magnification electron micrograph that shows that this is a bacteria that he found produces antibiotics to protect the ant environment by killing the, the predatory pathogens in that environment. And the relationship between this ant and this bacteria that has evolved to live with the ant is called a symbiosis. And in fact, the, the bacteria benefits as well as the ants have evolved glands to, to provide nutrients to uh, this uh, bacteria. And our platform posits that identifying natural product antibiotics from these symbiotic microbes um, is likely to be uh, effective uh, and, and very safe. Next slide. Fortunately, this relationship, this symbiotic relationship between antibiotic producing symbiotic bacteria and insects is not unique to ants. In fact, every insect species in which we've explored, we identify a similar relationship and the production of novel anti-infectives. In fact, this isn't even unique to insects. 
um, we found similar relationships in novel antibiotics uh, produced from symbiotic microbes from marine animals as well. Next slide. One recent discovery um, that we're particularly excited about uh, is the discovery of an antifungal that we've named turbinmycin uh, that is produced by a bacteria called Micromonospora that is actually a component of the microbiome of the sea squirt. We're excited about this discovery for really three reasons. Uh, one, it seems safe and effective in animals, which we hope is predictive of efficacy in patients. It appears to have a novel mechanism of action such that existing resistance mechanisms uh, do not affect its activity. And it in fact does have activity against the most common drug resistant pathogens, including an emerging pathogen called Candida auris that results in death in two of three patients infected spreads rapidly in hospitals and res is resistant to most of our uh, antifungal drugs that we have available. Next slide. So thus far, um, we've made what we think is reasonable pro uh, progress um, among the more than 5 million insect species uh, that are estimated to exist on earth. We've already collected more than uh, 10,000 insect and marine species uh, isolated the symbiotic microbes from these space, uh, species and screened uh, thousands of these for uh, novel antibiotics. Among these screens, we've identified hundreds of novel antibacterials and antifungals, and more than 150 have demonstrated efficacy in preclinical infection models. Five of them uh, we are now progressing uh, uh, towards patients uh, so we're excited about the promise of that uh, and, and hope that in the next five to 10 years, um, some of this will, uh, will help combat uh, this emerging antimicrobial resistance. Next slide. I just want to end uh, by noting the importance of the team science that's required uh, for these discoveries uh, and, and the many, many very, very talented people who contributed to this work. Thanks, Dean Golden. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Andes. This story from its beginning, I have found to be totally fascinating and it just gets better and better. Uh, I think urban legend says that uh, Fleming made his discovery on some old moldy bread. And now we have moved from moldy bread to leaf cutting ants and sea squirts. So uh, much more excitement uh, to come. Now it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Nasia Safdar. Dr. Safdar is a professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases within our Department of Medicine and leads research trials and clinical programs focused on the prevention and management of antibiotic resistance. She also serves as the Medical Director of Infection Control at UW Health. Welcome, Dr. Softar. Thanks very much, Dean Golden. So I'll be talking today about treatment of a particularly troublesome pathogen, particularly in the healthcare setting, called Clostridium difficile infection. Next slide. The goal of today's session will be to review the role of the gut bacteria and its interactions in C. difficile infection, which I'll call C. diff from now on, and describe how gut bacteria can be an unexpected source of relief in treating C. diff. Next slide. Before we go to that, we should review some terminology. So the normal gut microbiota, uh, we talk about it in two ways. One is the gut microbiome, which is simply a collection of genes that is present in the genomes of microbial species. So when we say the gut microbiome, we are referring to the constellation of genes that are present in the gut. And then when we talk about microbiota, that's referring to the collection of microbes or microbial species that form this consortium, which takes up residence in our intestine. The last statement on this slide bears a little thinking about. We are a multi-species consortium of human cells, microbial cells, human genes, and microbial species. And in fact, there are more bacterial cells in us than there are human cells. That's a pretty humbling prospect. Next slide. The normal gut microbiota exists in perfect harmony. 
between human cells and microbial cells. And there's a state of symbiosis, just as Dr. Andy's mentioned in other settings, that symbiosis exists within the human body too. But if there's any imbalance in this normally harmonious relationship, that is what results in illness or disease. Next slide. Now, what constitutes the gut microbiota? It seems odd, but until very recently, we didn't have the capability to actually diagnose how many types of different microbes were there in the intestine because there weren't any good methods to identify them. Now there's a whole plethora of uh, culture independent diagnostic techniques which can tell us what exists in the gut and the discoveries keep coming. It's pretty amazing that over 50 different bacterial phyla or bacterial types have been described. Uh, they constitute 60% of dry weight of feces and they can broadly be broken up into four or five different classes. And it's that balance that is critical because any imbalance in that will cause issues. Um, and you know, fun fact is that the bacterial cells are 10 times greater than the number of human cells. So it's not even just a little bit more, it's tenfold more. Next slide. So how do we further our understanding of what the gut microbiota is doing? The resident populations in the intestine seem far too important to simply be bystanders. And so there are three lines of inquiry that will tell us and give us more understanding of this. The first on the left-hand part of the slide is really the more fundamental, what microbes are there? What even exists? And in what areas of the intestine would you find most of them? And the answer to that is in the colon. The middle part of the slide then goes further and says, what are these microbes doing? How are they interacting with each other? How are they conferring benefit to the host? Uh, and how are they getting advantaged by living in whatever part of the gut they're living in? And on the right-hand part of the slide is really the most important, the holy grail of interventions is, what is the potential of harnessing this gut microbiome for human health and to reduce human disease? Next slide. Now, the gut microbiota do not remain static throughout the life cycle. As you go in this slide from the left-hand side to the baby, all the way over to the right to the older adult, you can see from the color chain that's happening in those pie charts um, is that the relative abundance of different types of bacteria goes up and down. And anywhere where you see a little red in that color, that suggests that there are types of bacteria that normally aren't there and aren't helpful to the host. Uh, so with age uh, comes with uh, medical conditions, you might find that those bacteria uh, proliferate and overpower the normal bacteria. Um, and this is a very expected and predictable transition of the gut microbiota throughout life. Next slide. So now we come to the specific case of the infection that I've spent the last two decades doing research on, which is Clostridium difficile infection. Next slide. Clostridium difficile infection or C. diff is the classic example of gut dysbiosis or an imbalance between the normal gut bacteria. Now there's a lot of things that can cause this gut microbiota imbalance. We know of antibiotics as the classic culprit because just as they kill bad bacteria, which are the ones causing infection, they also kill good bacteria in the gut. And therein becomes a void that C. diff rushes to fill. But there are other things that can cause imbalance in the gut microbiota. Surgery, for instance, particularly surgery on the gut, malnutrition, um, obesity, illness of any type. And there are many illnesses where you wouldn't expect the gut microbacteria to be um, challenged by it, but, but nonetheless they are because it's the entire system that gets affected. And then the recent evidence suggests that there are medications other than antibiotics, for instance, proton pump inhibitors that are commonly found over the counter and people use them to, to treat heartburn. Many cancer therapeutics also have antimicrobial properties in addition to their anti-cancer effects, and those can also impact the gut microbiota. Next slide. So we're looking at about 500,000 cases a year, about 30,000 deaths. Now, some of you may know people who've been diagnosed with C. diff, or you may even have experienced it yourself. And if so, then you will know that the major issue with C. diff is not necessarily the fact that it causes severe diarrheal infection in people, but that there's a 30% recurrence. So you're never really free of it. It becomes a vicious cycle where a first recurrence leads to a much higher chance for a second recurrence and a third recurrence and so on. And so it has a major impact on quality of life and suffering. And the incidence is highest in people over the age of 65, which is also the group that often will have complicated medical conditions. And many patients have mentioned to us that they have completely altered their way of life in order to accommodate the possibility that they must be in proximity of a restroom at all times. Next slide. So here's a classic example of a 52-year-old immunocompromised individual who's had a kidney transplant. They have a history of C. diff 
following surgery and antibiotic use, which is often used in such patients because they either get an infection or to prevent one, and several courses of treatments of C. diff later, they still have uncontrolled diarrhea. Most of the treatments that we conventionally use for C. diff will temporize things, they'll hold things at bay. Typically, it seems odd, but you treat C. diff with another antibiotic. So fighting fire with fire is a temporizing approach, but not a long-term sustainable solution. And so when you stop the treatment, then the diarrhea comes back. And so their quality of life is severely impacted. And the question they often ask us, you know, why is this happening? And what are the treatment options? Next slide. Well, what might give us some more insight into this if we analyze the stool microbiota of patients who have uh, not had C. diff, have had one episode of C. diff, or have had more than one episode of C. diff. So on the left-hand slide side of the slide, you can see the control patients in this particular study. And these control patients had a normal gut bacteria and didn't have any C. diff. And you can see the relative distribution of the bacteria uh, with about equal parts red and green, the green being bacteroides, the red being firmicutes, which are the two main types of bacteria that make up the normal gut bacteria. In the middle part of the slide, you see patients who have had one episode of C. diff. And you can see that the colors don't really change very much. It's still a good relative distribution of green and red. And so with one episode of C. diff, if it can be successfully treated, then the patients typically do well. On the right-hand side of the slide, we see recurrent C. diff. And there you can see this giant bar of purple, which represents bacteria that are unwelcome and generally not helpful to the host. Next slide. So what can we do to manipulate the gut microbiota to restore it? Well, a seemingly unlikely treatment is stool transplant, also called fecal microbiota transplantation, new in humans, relatively speaking, but has been used in the veterinary field for decades as a way to treat diarrhea in horses, that you take healthy stool from another animal, in our case, another human, and instill it into the intestine of the person suffering from C. diff. Next slide. Now, believe it or not, it's pretty easy to do this, and all the supplies that you would need are shown in the slide here, although we don't recommend that people try this at home. Next slide. It can also be available in pill form, um, other than an enema and via colonoscopy. Next. And this is the study that led to the widespread use of, of fecal microbiota transplantation. On the left-hand side, you can see that when people were given an infusion of donor feces, their cure rate from C. diff was much higher than on the right-hand side of the figure where they were only given antibiotics for treatment. And this has then led to an increasing recognition that this is really the most effective therapy we have for C. diff to date. Next slide. There are other reasons why FMT should be employed for treatment of C. diff. There's not likely to be a production shortage and there's no addiction potential. Next slide. So to summarize, C. diff is caused by antibiotic use which produces imbalance in the gut microbiome. And fecal microbiota transplant is a highly effective therapy, especially for recurrent C. diff, because it restores the normal gut microbiota. Next slide. I just want to acknowledge the village that it takes, UW Health, the clinical and UW Research FMT program. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you, Dean Colton. Absolutely fascinating, Dr. Saftar. And I, I don't know whether this exciting new treatment should be considered high tech or low tech. I mean, in a way it's uh, elegant in its uh, simplicity and uh, lesson to be learned uh, from a prevention perspective is that uh, this is why um, patients who have a non-bacterial sore throat should not be disappointed when their doctor doesn't overprescribe or misprescribe an antibiotic since it might be killing off the healthy bacteria in the gut. Uh, and with little efficacy for a non-bacterial infection in their throat. So uh, a lot of interesting stuff there. Thank you so much. Our final researcher this evening is Dr. Bruce Klein. Dr. Klein holds the Gerald B. O'Dell Professorship and the Shirley Machette Professorship. He's the chief of our Pediatric Infectious Disease Division and is a professor of pediatrics internal medicine, as well as medical microbiology and immunology. Welcome, Dr. Klein. Thanks so much, Dr. Uh, Dingen. Um, next slide, please. So what else can we do when all else fails in managing an untreatable infection? You've now heard examples of mining new antibiotics from natural products 
and treats built around our own gut microbes. I'm going to tell you how we can harness our natural immune defenses to fight seemingly untreatable infections. Next slide, please. We know about the importance of white blood cells in fighting infection, especially the role of white blood cells called neutrophils, the cells that make pus while cleansing infections. From studies in patients with leukemia, we know that as neutrophil counts fall, heading on, heading on this from right to left, risk of infection rises accordingly. Risk of nearly 30% with white blood, white blood cell counts or neutrophil counts less than 100. Next, next slide, please. To combat this situ situation, neutro neutrophil transfusions were tried over a half a century ago, but they fell, fell out of her due to the modest effect, effect the inconsistent benefit, and, and risk of ad adverse events. Ne next slide, In carefully con controlled clinical trials, however, we do know that neutral transfusions can reduce the, the risk and treat infection. This study shows us that patients that re receive transfusions were more likely to survive infection, especially if they got very, very large numbers of cells. However, neutrophils are fragile and generally short-lived, making it difficult to maintain large, large numbers of viable cells, especially trillions required for benefit. Next slide. Among the greatest challenges we face in modern medicine today are deadly fungi that cause drug-resistant infections around the world. This challenge was coincidentally highlighted as the cover and lead story in yesterday's just released June issue of Scientific American. Next slide. Our interest in neutrophil transfusions for threatening fungal infections began with an exciting discovery. A young postdoctoral trainee in my lab, Scott Feitz, described discovery in a paper entitled The Unappreciated Role of Neutrophil Dendritic Hybrids in the Immunity to Invasive Fungal infect Infections. These white blood cells, also called neutrophil hybrids, are, are octopike in sh shape and they're ultra killers. They can snare or blanket their, their prey, as, as shown in the, in the EM guide for Candida albicans on, on the left, and cast a sp spike web, natural animal antibodies all over them, as shown, as shown on the right EM. For blastomyces, these are what I, what I would call Navy Seals neutrophils, ones we want to drift into action. Next slide, please. The longest feature featured in Scientific American called Candida auris, which Dr. And already touched on. It has crossed many, many countries and continents, also reared its head in UW Hospital. Most Candida auris veins are, are resistant to at least one, one common used anti antifungal drug, and nearly one out of three strains are resistant to multiple drugs. The fungus preys on the sickest and most vulnerable patients in the hospital, and it can kill up to two out of three infected patients, as you've already heard. While neutrophils, you will neutrophils, are unable to kill Candida auris, as shown on the right, right hand slide for standard neutrophils, we found in our lab that neutrophil hybrids are really pump killers of this fungus. Next slide. So we're excited and we're really optimistic by our current research that shows neutrophil hybrids kill fungi better than standard neutrophils. They recruit other white blood cells to help them in this battle against fungi. And they can survive for long periods, especially if they get stimulated by immune hormone, a product a cytokine called granulocyte macrophage colonizing factor, or for short, GEM-CSESF. Next slide, please. Typical neutrophils are exposed to GEM-CSESF, or granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, 
they quick, quickly on neutrophil hybrids as the bottom pan panel on the left. We found that, um, that GNCSF creates these, these hives much better than any, any other immune stimulus. As on the right, right for several human donors. Next slide. So what are next step steps? First, we're engineering GMCF, ground site macrophage column stimulating getting factor backpacks on, on nano articles that we code on hybrids during their journey within, within the human body. This helps them persist long and, and maintain their killing potency when they, they finally find their fung fungal target. Second, we've made hybrids from human stem, stem cells that we can now grow and accumulate in la large numbers in the laboratory without needing human donors. Or if you, you will, an off-the-shelf off immediate tr treatment. And we, we've also, uh, lower right, gene edited these cells with CRISPR. So they become essentially heat-seeking missiles that differentiate into the neutrophil hybrids better and find it in fungi much faster. Next slide. Finally, many thanks to the wonderful team of scientific collaborators, including microbiologists, chemists, immunologists, and stem cell biologists. And finally, thanks to in the audience for joining us tonight. Thanks, Dean Golden. Well, thank you, Bruce. Wow, you know, the, uh, the science fiction, uh, which is actually scientific fact, uh, just gets more and more exciting. And we've moved from uh, sea squirts to um, uh, fecal transplantation and now to uh, killer seal neutrophils. I mean, <laughs> this is really uh, amazing stuff uh, that's coming out of our uh, research laboratories at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. Well, uh, we now have time for uh, some questions that we've received from uh, some of uh, our audience. And uh, we are going to be working our way through as many of them as we can. So um, let me start here. Here's an interesting general question for whoever wants to uh, take it on. You know, recently, especially during the age of COVID, there has been a huge demand for daily exposure to antibacterial cleaners. I can't remember the last time I saw a bottle of liquid soap that didn't claim to have antibacterial properties in it. So with all these antibacterial products floating around our households, uh, does this have any potential impact in uh, public health concerns about antibiotic resistance or is this something that's okay? Uh, I Dave, maybe you want to take a stab at that or nausea? I can respond to that. So I think it depends on what's in the cleaning agents. Many of them have antiseptics, and antiseptics, because they have a broad spectrum of action, typically don't lead as much to antibiotic resistance. But things like triclosan, which is something that many things are impregnated with, which is, uh, is run, does run the risk of promoting antibacterial resistance. So I think the answer to the question is yes, uh, to varying degrees. Very interesting. Uh, so in other words, being an absolute uh, clean freak uh, might end up becoming part of the problem rather than part of the uh, solution. Uh, that's reassuring to me since I'm anything but a uh, clean freak. Uh, here's a question for you, uh, Dave. Um, can you give a brief summary of what is the timeline and the process for developing a new antibiotic for when you first think you found the molecule to when it might be available for treating human disease? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and the short answer is uh, longer than you'd think. Um, you know, somewhere in the five to 10 year range is sort of best case scenario when one considers the different phases of preclinical and then clinical development uh, that, that are required. And oh, by the way, probably about $300 million for each new anti-infective that you are able to get to patients. Wow. Hmm. Uh, Bruce, here's one for you. Um, 
how do life-threatening fungal infections differ from bacterial infections? What is it that differentiates fungi from uh, bacteria? Well, first of all, they're uh, much harder to treat. Uh, and, and one thing is that we, we have such a uh, small armamentarium of antifungal drugs. We, we have a, um, at the site, the emergence of resistance to antibacterials. We have many different kinds of antibiotics with multiple modes of action. We have four or perhaps five, only that number of classes of antifungal drugs. So there's, when you reach to the, to the shelf, there's a, a very small number. And um, fungi also grow much more slowly than bacteria do. And so it's hard to kill them because they grow so, so slowly. So for some fungal infections, for example, they need to treat them for six months or even a year, as opposed to a week for a bacterial infection. Wow, very interesting. Uh, Nasia, here's one for you. This is really interesting. You uh, described how the uh, composition of the human gut um, biome changes over the course of a lifetime. Do we have any information on how it has changed over the course of history with changes in the environment we live in, with changes in our diet? Do we have any historic data or any access to uh, material that could give us a sense of whether or not there has been a change over the last quarter century or 50 years or so? Or is it fairly constant going back to earliest days of uh, civilization? I think one of the biggest factors that's often under-recognized that completely shapes the gut microbiota is one's diet and nutrition. So what is known is that, for instance, the typical Western diet is associated with a relatively unfavorable profile of gut microbiota compared to people that are hunter-gatherers or foragers, such as may be found in, in other continent, continents that haven't quite had the exposure to processed foods that we have had here. It's a bit difficult to go back very far because the techniques to analyze these have only recently become available, but it's pretty clear that it has evolved over time and, and not necessarily in, in the best direction. Thank you. Here's a question that uh, any of you could answer, but I'm going to uh, start off with uh, Dr. Uh, Andes. This really is fascinating research. How does it get funded? Who's paying for all these amazing uh, studies ranging from the molecular to the uh, clinical trial? It's a great question. Uh, we've been very fortunate um, to have a variety of funding sources. Um, I would say the great majority of the funding comes from the National Institutes of Health, uh, but we've also benefited greatly um, from pilot funding from the University of Wisconsin, including the School of Medicine and Public Health. And very importantly, some of our most promising pilot work um, is funded um, by private donors. Thanks. Uh, Bruce, here's, here's an interesting one. Uh, getting back to the exciting work with revving up these uh, super killer uh, neutrophils, um, do we need to worry that if somebody has been treated or is simultaneously being treated with um, uh, antibiotics, could they have an impact on the uh, effectiveness of the uh, supercharged uh, neutrophils? Um, that's, that's a great question. In fact, um, um, you can work work synergy. They often help help one another. So um, I would say they that um, there's a symbiotic relationship between the beneficial effect of a, the, of an antimicrobial and the natural host immune system. Thanks. Uh, Nasia, here's one for you. It's actually a couple of questions uh, linked to the uh, uh, fecal uh, transplantation uh, procedure. What makes a patient a candidate uh, for that? What are the criteria you look for uh, in deciding that this might be the best way to go? And outside of research-intensive academic health centers, 
Um, how common is this uh, when used by practitioners in the general community? I would say it's become increasingly common now that people have recognized that it's a very effective way for treatment. Generally speaking, you would probably, if you were in a, in a small center, you would probably still need to refer to a larger academic center, but those referrals are happening in, in droves, I would say. Um, the right person who might benefit from FMT for C. diff is someone who's experienced multiple episodes um, such that FMT has the greatest benefit in them. But beyond that, there's not a lot of reasons why somebody couldn't get an FMT. It can be administered in so many different ways, by mouth, by the colon, et cetera, that people will find one route that um, appeals to them more than others. Um, I think the biggest thing to recognize is that even though it is very effective, uh, if you take antibiotics for another reason down the road, mm -hmm. you might land back at square one. Well, a uh, related uh, topic is, uh, you know, over the counter, there are a lot of products that are advertised as probiotic, that they can presumably create the good kind of um, uh, bi bi biome uh, to help prevent disease. Uh, is there any evidence that those kinds of products that are sold with advertisements on TV are good for preventing um, the wrong mix. Uh, are there any trials that suggest that they are effective treatments for um, uh, Clostridia? Most of the trials that have been done have used a species of bacteria called Lactobacillus GG. And LGG has been effective in preventing C. diff. I think by the time people get C. diff, there's very little that a probiotic can do as adjunctive treatment, but it is a reasonable method for prevention. Uh, say if you're taking an antibiotic and you want to avoid getting antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Uh, there's a lot of variation in probiotics. Many of them don't have any viable bacteria, which is what is needed for efficacy. So depending upon how long they've been sitting in the store, you may or may not get the product that you think you're getting. And the other thing is, you know, like everything else, context matters here. A single bacteria being plunked down in the middle of this complex environment in the intestine is likely to find itself overwhelmed. Excellent point. Uh, Dave, here's a question for you. Uh, we physicians, even those of us who are not ID experts, know that there are some patients, uh, patients with valvular heart disease, that need to have antibiotic prophylaxis before they go in for dental surgery or something like that. However, in the experience of at least one dean I know, sometimes without any history like that, if you're going in for a simple procedure, uh, like, say, a uh, root canal, uh, the dentist might recommend preventative antibiotic treatment for a day or so. Is that something to be concerned about, or does the risk seem low enough for healthy people to have a couple of days of an antibiotic to um, make the uh, potential benefit uh, worthwhile? I think there's three components to that. One is, is that certainly there are certain procedures for which uh, subsequent infections are um, can occur and, and prophylaxis with antibiotics can help. Um, that being said, as Dr. Safdar has, has uh, nicely illustrated, even a single dose of one of these antibiotics when it's not indicated can lead to overgrowth uh, and, and C. difficile. And importantly, we know that uh, the fastest way to lose the uh, usefulness of an antibiotic is, is to use that antibiotic. And so a prudent use of antimicrobials or stewardship is critical. So when you don't need an antibiotic, I would not take an antibiotic. Excellent point. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, uh, how are these uh, neutrophil hybrids discovered and developed. How long has this story been in, uh, in progress? They were initially identified, um, perhaps so surprisingly, mice as a very rare population. Um, only in the last few years have we confirmed them that they circulate in humans, um, particularly uh, being recruited to sites of infection in very low numbers. Um, um, they're all found sometimes uh, in, the, in the joints of, of individuals with an autoimmune disorder. And um, 
we've discovered them in an, an animal model of fungal infection where they were recruited to the lung um, of an animal that had acquired a severe fungal infection and they represented only about a few percent of the neutrophils that accumulated in the lung, but they had an outsized role of killing fungi, about 10 to 100 times better than regular neutrophils. So this was an aha moment, uh, thinking that we could harness, you know, these um, Navy SEAL-like neutrophils for better purposes. Interesting. Uh, here's a question for, uh, for Dr. Safdar. Um, so my close friend and colleague, uh, Dean Markle in School of Vet Medicine, uh, really has done a wonderful job of uh, emphasizing one health, the interrelationship between the health of other animal species and the uh, human species. And uh, I know that antibiotics are used in food production. Uh, I also know that uh, where I shop, I'm not going to give any endorsement of where I shop, but where I shop, uh, you can pay extra money and buy products that were raised without antibiotics. Uh, can you say a little bit about the interplay from a public health perspective of human health? Uh, what is the interrelatedness between the use of antibiotics in uh, the food industry? Uh, and is there any advantage for a given person from the perspective of avoiding messing up with the, uh, uh, their own microbiome of um, ingesting food, presumably well-cooked food, that maybe was raised with antibiotics. I think that One Health and the concept of you know, human health and animal health being intertwined is really undergoing an evolution. And it's become pretty clear that you can't tackle antibiotic resistance in humans without also tackling the problem in food production in animals. And so it's a sobering fact that more antibiotics are used outside of human health than they are in humans. So no matter what we do on the human side, we won't make progress without the bigger picture. For an individual, probably it matters little, I think what they consume as long as it's healthy and, and is well cooked and so on. But from an ecological perspective, you know, the use of antibiotics in animals deserves the same scrutiny and stewardship that the use of antibiotics in humans does. And for instance, this trend of using antibiotics to promote growth, I think is also undergoing a change where it is no longer being used. And certainly the um, antibiotics in dairy cattle is highly regulated and is, is not permitted. So I think we have some room to go there, but it seems to be heading in the right direction. That's good news. Uh, Dave, here's one for you. With the year that just passed, and we're not out of the woods yet, but we're seeing the uh, end of the forest. Um, a, a lot of good public health measures came into play because of COVID, including um, a lot of hand washing, more than I've ever seen before, uh, social distancing, of course, and mask wearing. And uh, we, we have heard that, in fact, uh, influenza rates were down. Um, do you think there'll be any meaningful lasting impact in terms of uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, because presumably, I'm guessing, maybe there's been less transmission of streptococcal infections or other uh, infections. Do you, do you think that's going to slow the curve a little bit, or is that just a minor blip in the curve? You know, while some bacterial and fungal pathogens are transmitted person to person and in the healthcare setting, um, you know, we've still seen even this year um, the same number of resistant bacterial and fungal infections in our patients. And so um, I fear that this is not going to have a big impact on antimicrobial resistance. I think it's antimicrobial use um, and hopefully discovering new anti-infectives that will make the difference. Okay, well, one last question, and I'm gonna ask uh, each of you to comment on, uh, on this. You have each presented incredibly exciting work. I, I think that all of us uh, hearing about this, even those of us who have heard earlier chapters, can't help but be really excited about what's going on. So from your perspective, being the folks right in the uh, forefront of all this, what makes you most excited about the future of your work and the future of this whole uh, topic? What do you 
uh, find really get you up in the morning uh, with a sense of optimism for our capacity to really wage effective war against these uh, microbes. Uh, Dr. Klein, let me start with you. Thanks, Dean Golden. Um, I, I would say that uh, this past year or two has revealed the awesome power of, of vaccines for, for public health. health. And um, while we've talked about um, immunotherapeutic engines for life-threatened engines, what makes me really excited um, is the pros prospect fungal vaccines are on the horizon within our grass. I would have to say that despite the many, many viral vac vaccines that we have, we have and even some, some bacterial vaccines, there is not a one-on-one -on -one vaccine against fungi. And um, I, am, um, I am betting that within, within the next few years, we will see a, a fungal vaccine. Um, roll that out into the market. <laughs> great, great. Uh, Nasia, what gets you most excited? For me, I think it's the potential to promote human health and really undertake interventions upstream so that patients don't have to suffer from an infection while we figure out ways to treat it. I think antibiotic stewardship is a very exciting area along those lines. And I think working with multidisciplinary teams where we learn new methods and new innovations and, and learning from history is always fun. Dave, what uh, what gets you out of bed in the morning with a uh, sense of real excitement? Well, aside from getting to work with some amazing smart people every day, I think we're we're really hopeful that this platform is is going to make a difference for patients. That we are going to find antibiotics that are going to make it to the market and make a difference. Great. Well. Thank the three of you so much. This has really been wonderful. And I also want to thank everybody who has uh, been in the audience this evening for joining us and for your great questions. I hope you've enjoyed this program tonight as much as I've enjoyed it. Uh, speaking for myself as well as for my partner, Dr. Alan Kaplan, the CEO for UW Health, we have really enjoyed showcasing the remarkable work of some of our outstanding faculty including a sampling of the remarkably innovative cutting edge science that keeps our School of Medicine and Public Health and UW Health really at the forefront of the future of medicine. So thanks again to tonight's presenters and really to all of our scientists who have joined us over the course of the year. And most of all, thanks to all of you for joining us and for your encouragement and support. Now, a brief infomercial. If you're interested, you can watch all of our past editions at wiskmedicine.org. And that concludes this program and it concludes this academic year's uh, schedule. Thank you for your time and interest and on Wisconsin. Good night.